Man said to me, page 48. Long after I had resumed normal life again, that means a long time after my release from camp, somebody showed me an illustrated weekly with photographs of prisoners lying crowded on their bunks, staring dully at a visitor. Isn't this terrible, dreadful staring faces? Everything about it. Why? I asked. For I genuinely did not understand. For that moment, I saw it all again. At 5 a.m., it was still pitch dark outside. I was lying on the hard walls in an earthen hut where about 70 of us were taken care of. We were sick and did not have to leave camp for work. We did not have to go on parade. We could lie all day in our little corner in a hut and doze and wait for the daily distribution of bread which of course was reduced for the sink, and for the daily helping of soup, watered down and also decreased in quantity. But how content we were, happy in spite of everything, while we cowered against each other to avoid any unnecessary loss of warmth, and were too lazy and disinterested to move a finger unnecessarily, we heard shrill whistles and shouts from the square where the night ship had just returned and was assembling for roll call. The door was flung open and the snowstorm blew into our hut. An exhausted comrade, covered with snow, stumbled inside to sit down for a few minutes. But the senior warden turned him out again. It was strictly forbidden to admit the stranger to a hut while a checkup on the men was in progress. How sorry I was for that fellow, and how glad not to be in his skin at that moment, but instead be sick and able to doze on in the sick quarters. What a lifesaver it was to have two days there, and perhaps even two extra days after those. All this came to my mind when I saw the photographs in the magazine. When I explained, my listeners understood why I did not find the photograph so terrible. People shown on him might not have been so happy after all, might not have been so unhappy after all. On my fourth day in the sick quarters, I had just been detained to the night shift when the chief doctor rushed in and asked me to volunteer for medical duties in another camp containing typhus patients. Against the urgent advice of my friends, and despite the fact that almost none of my colleagues offered their services, I decided to volunteer. I knew that in a working party, I would die in a short time. But if I had to die, there might as well be some sense in my death. I thought that it was doubtless to be more to purpose to try and help my comrades as a doctor and to vegetate or finally lose my life as the unproductive laborer that I was then. For me, this was simple mathematics, not sacrifice. But secretly, the warrant officer from the sanitation squad had ordered that the two doctors who had volunteered for typhus camp should be taken care of till they left. We looked so weak that he feared that he might have two additional corpses on his hands rather than two doctors.